I would like to introduce our guests for the evening. We have four distinguished guests with us. Morgan Daybell is the business manager at Franklin Northeast Supervisory Union, and Heather Bushy is the director of finance for Essex Westford School District. And they are going to give us the rundown on the budget process and uh, some of the parameters that we need to be paying attention to in the budget process and particularly highlighting the board's involvement in that because clearly the board doesn't do the whole thing. Um, we also have with us tonight, Neil O'Dell, who in addition to serving as the board president for VSBA is vice chair of his home school board, the Dres Dresden School District, which is part of, I believe it's still the only interstate school district with New Hampshire. Am I right about that, Neil? Uh, we actually have two. So Rivendell, right up the road Rivendell. is the other interstate district. Thank you. And Nancy Russell is also with us tonight. She too is on the VSBA board as a regional representative, and she is a member of the Hartford School District down in, um, well, in that part of the state. So we've got geography represented, we've got different kinds of school dis districts represented. And Neil and Nancy will chime in um, appropriately for the, during the budget discussion, but they're also gonna stick around and we're gonna talk about what to expect at a board meeting. I, I trust by now most of the new board members have attended a meeting or two, um, but you may not have all made it yet. And so we'll talk about what you have experienced and, and what, what kinds of expectations you should have. So with that, I will turn this over to Morgan. Um, and Morgan, I think you should be able to, ah, excellent, Debbie, you're here. While Morgan is getting his slides organized and getting ready, Debbie, might I impose on you to introduce yourself? Of course, thanks, Susan. Hi, everyone, I'm Debbie Singheiser. And I have not yet met any of you yet because uh, today is my very first day with the VSBA. I am um, taking over from Phil as the director of school board services. And um, I'm looking forward to meeting everybody uh, at some point, either on Zoom or in person and look forward to meeting you, getting to know you, working with you, and of course, supporting you in any way that I can. Um, so I just wanted to introduce myself tonight to say welcome aboard and um, thank you, Susan, for pitch hitting for us during this interim period between Phil and myself. We really appreciate that. And I will not be staying on Zoom for much longer because ironically enough, I serve as a recording secretary for the Barstow Unified School District Board and we have our meeting tonight. So I'm gonna have to scoot along, but I wanted to take this opportunity to say hello to everyone. So thanks, Susan. Uh, thank you. I'm glad you're here, at least to say hello. And thank you for mentioning about board meetings. So if anyone else has a board meeting that you have to scootle off to, we certainly understand that. We try to schedule our meetings um, at very, you know, different times of day and different days of the week so that hopefully you can make most of them. Um, and, and clearly there's no good time for everybody. So that's one of the reasons that we do record everything. So Morgan, I think we're gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Susan. And thank you everyone um, out there in the audience for being here. Um, if we were in person, I would ask for a show of hands to get a sense of how many of you um, willingly sought out your seat on the school board versus being um, pressed into service or begged or otherwise dragged to the polls. Um, if, uh, if the statewide experience is anything like um, the one we have up here, it's a challenge to get people to fill these roles. And so um, uh, I certainly appreciate it um, and appreciate you guys taking the time to, to uh, dig into what the actual work is. Um, similar to that, um, Heather Bushy is with me tonight and we've pressed her into service. Um, this will be her first spin doing this presentation. And so I'm gonna do most of the driving and then 
Heather and um, and both Neil and Nancy uh, will be jumping in at different times as well. Um, I think Susan wants people funneling questions to her. Um, there are a couple of natural stopping points in the presentation, but I am happy to field questions um, even mid-sentence if it makes sense for folks. If people want their questions to be anonymous, if you use the chat function and send them it only to Carrie Lamb, then she will read your questions out and they re remain anonymous. If you don't care, you want to speak up, if you would just raise your little digital Zoom hand, we'll get you that way. Thank you. And so we're going to walk you through um, three sort of big um, pieces of the, the budgeting world for, um, for serving on a school board. The first is around understanding budgets. So if you haven't been to a meeting yet, you'll be at one soon and you'll start to see these um, this information coming in from your superintendent's office. And we wanted to give you kind of a, the 10,000 foot view of some of the numbers and concepts that you're going to be looking at. Um, so the first concept that we wanted to go over was that of funds. And there are different sources of money and different buckets or different pockets that you as school board uh, members are in charge of. The general fund is the fund that we use to operate the day-to-day the -day work of the district. This is the one that people are most familiar with. And one of the differences of this uh, fund and the others that we'll talk about is that by statute, any money that you have left over at the end of the year on June 30th um, is going to go back to your voters. Um, and then the main source of this fund is, uh, is money from the Vermont Education Fund. There are other funds that, um, that you will certainly uh, hear about and see some reports about. Um, special revenue funds are um, grant monies that come in. They may not have that same uh, July to June timeline. They may go over um, uh, more than a year. And they're kept in a, in a separate bucket for the most part. They're reported on separately um, by your administration. Um, you also may have funds such as uh, scholarship funds or capital reserve funds. And these are pockets of money that are really um, allocated and kept in place for a specific purpose. So those construction or capital reserve funds, um, they might sit out there for five or 10 years without being touched. But when you find that you need a new roof on one of your schools, uh, the funds are accessed at that point. And then scholarship funds are probably a little more self-explanatory. They're sitting out there and then you're drawing down as, as you have kids going off to further education that qualify for those. Um, I've got a slide here and I think Neil's gonna talk um, a little bit later as well about the education fund. Um, this is the, the bucket of money that funds the regular school budgets across the state. Um, there are a lot of different um, funding streams. Um, the first one is um, uh, what we have here is general purpose taxes. So that's the lottery money, sales and use tax, um, a bit of the vehicle purchase tax, um, and then a bit of uh, meals and rooms tax. Uh, the other two thirds of this are coming from non-homestead property taxes and then um, also homestead property taxes. And those are really calculated differently. So we keep them separate. Um, and then something that we'll touch on a little bit later, about 68% of homeowners in Vermont pay based on their income rather than their property tax. So that's the 68% of the the homestead property taxpayers, which is that one, roughly one quarter of the Ed Fund. Um, when we talk about expenses on a on a month to month basis, um, you will likely see reports with a long string of codes. That's going to seem a little bit Greek to you. Really, that's just a, a system that we use. Um, for each expense that comes in or each piece of revenue that comes in to try to identify it. And we do that based on what grades we're, um, we're spending on. Um, 
which programs it's spent on. So is it uh, instructing kids or is it um, support for staff or support for students? Um, ultimately, how is it being paid? Is it coming from the general fund or is that money coming from a grant? Um, and then what are we buying with it? Are we buying people? Are we buying things? Are we buying um, something, some in, intangible service with it? Um, so we won't go into any depth on that, but um, but know when you're looking at those reports that, that we have the ability to, to monitor our expenses that way. And then very briefly, um, you may have already seen this in your meetings, but um, there's a, a an approval process that each board creates um, for allowing those checks to go out. Um, the, the final approval does rest with the board and there is some sort of process called a warrant process that's um, in effect everywhere. Um, I put up a few examples. I know in, in my district, we have moved to um, electronic warrants. So we will send out um, the list of expenses that we wanna pay to the full board. And as soon as we have two board members look at them and say, yeah, these are okay to pay, we will send those checks out. Um, different systems have different procedures for that. Um, they're all okay. I don't know, Heather or, or Neil or uh, Nancy, do you wanna weigh in on how things are done in your districts if they're different? I'm happy to weigh in. We also use an electronic system for our approval and um, our, uh, our approval happens subsequent to um, the um, expenditures happening. So it's a, a process that happens after the fact. Uh, I would say that we're pretty much the same, although a combination of electronic and then um, paper. Uh, so electronic approvals by two board members uh, each week. And then um, ultimately all board members then sign uh, paper copies at the next regular board meeting. Ours are basically the same way, except that just um, our chair is the one who who signs all of the checks and, and uh, they're presented to him at each of the board meetings. All right, so some slight differences there. I know um, there are some systems where that warrant process has been delegated completely to the administration and there are um, some systems still and when I was a school board member 20 years ago, this is kind of how we were just starting to get away from this, where you sit at a board meeting and you go over every piece of paper and sign off on it. Um, not a, my opinion, not a great use of time, but I believe there are still some systems where that's, um, that's the process. So next up, um, we're gonna talk about the budget building process in our systems. Um, I don't know, uh, Susan, if there are any questions that are sitting out there before we move on to that. We actually have, let's see, a comment. I'm just starting to read it. It says, I'll be interested in hearing more details about what electronic approval of warrants looks like. Our district still presents paper warrants that are uh, signed by all board members, maybe a separate mini session. Okay. That's something to think about for the future. Yeah, thank you for that suggestion. Um, uh, there are a lot of those kinds of details that we would love to do mini sessions on, um, and we don't always know what they are. So thank you for the suggestion. It will go into the, the think tank, um, and I can't promise when we might do something like that, but hang on, it's coming. <laughs> Okay, um, so the budget building process is, I think, one of the more important and probably one of the hey, more- sweetie, I'm in that meeting. Audrey, I'm in that meeting. Is one of the um, more important and one of the more time intensive um, pieces of being a school board member. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through the process that I do with my um, with my three boards, um, and then I'll have the other folks kind of weigh in on how things look a little bit differently. And again, feel free to, um, to shoot any questions to Susan as we move along on this. Um, what I do, you know, this is 
kind of the, the general um, introduction to uh, as school board members, what you'll want to get out of this. And it's to understand the timeline that, that your district or your districts go through and then how the goals and priorities of the board and the administration um, feed into that. Um, we'll talk about those key budget factors a little bit later. And then finally, um, you need to understand as board members what the tax impact of your decision of warning that budget is. Um, because when you're at the gas station or the post office or the grocery store, um, no matter how much we talk about programs, um, tax rates and tax impacts seem to be what people are most concerned about. Um, so this is a, a schedule that I brought one of my boards through last fall. Um, it is probably somewhat similar. Um, and I will kind of walk you through this and let other folks um, weigh in. It's, uh, I have two districts and a supervisory union. So we tend to start the process earlier at the supervisory union because we need to come up with that assessment figure that goes out to the districts. And then one of my districts tuitions all of their high school kids out to mostly to the other district. And so we're trying to get the tuition rate set before the sending district's budget is set as well. Um, but we start here in October. Um, the Act 173 plan is um, our best guess at that time for what special ed budgets are gonna look like um, across the system. Um, that's required by statute at that time. And so that's really for our system the first budget that we begin to build. Um, and then I will take um, a first budget walkthrough with my board and their November meetings. I may actually push this up a month um, this year because of all the, the changes that are going on. And I will focus on staffing and benefits at that meeting and I'll explain why in a little bit. On December 1st, we get the yield proposal from the tax commissioner. Um, I will talk a little bit about that later on. And I know that Neil has a great presentation on this. Um, that's one of the four numbers that we wait for that sets the tax rate. Um, that'll be on your warnings in March. Um, we'll go to the, to the December meetings, um, start fleshing out some of the other expenses uh, in those budgets in addition to salaries. And then in December, mid-December, we will get um, what up until this year is called the equalized pupil count, which is basically the number of kids that you get to divide your budget out over. That's the second number um, that impacts tax rates. By the end of December, we'll get the common level of appraisal that also is impacting your tax rates. And then in my system, we are warning budgets usually in that second week of January and going to press um, with budgets towards the end of January. I have some other dates up there um, for my boards just to remind them when they need to get their petitions in and when we will be um, needing to, to finalize and warn our budgets um, in local papers and, and post it around town. So um, Heather is in a, a completely unified system. So she only has one district. Um, Heather, I'll punt it to you and you can talk about anything that's different in terms of the schedule. And then Neil and Nancy, if you guys do something different as well. Yeah, I'm happy to share. Um, it looks pretty similar. However, um, in our district, our vote doesn't happen until April. So we have the luxury of a little bit more time um, and it allows us to get a little bit more information as well before we have to finalize everything. So our budget gets warned um, in the March timeframe. So um, we start right around the same time in October internally, um, but we just get that extra uh, month to wrap things up. Ours in Hartford is basically the same as what you've got up here on schedule wise. Yeah, and I would just add that, um, you know, I think the one of the important things for folks to realize is that a lot of this stuff is determined by that very last date. So the date of whenever your town meeting is, 
And then you basically work backwards um, because then certain things need to happen by certain days in order for town meeting to go off um, uh, on, on schedule. Um, for us, we kind of begin, well, uh, honestly, probably sometime in August um, when we'll spin up a budget committee uh, that will then take a look at trying to do a quick, um, what we call our quick model. So taking a look at what the budget might look like given the things that we do know for example, like what um, we've got for negotiated settlements. So we might know what the salary increases will be for teachers, support staff and such. For those other things that we don't necessarily know, we can just sort of apply a CPI increase to things. And that gives us a really rough idea of what the budget might look like going forward. Uh, committee develops some budget guidelines that the board then approves usually in September, October, which gives us then some guidelines for administration and board as they go ahead and build out that budget um, but then, yeah, everything else sort of follows uh, a very similar um, outline that uh, Morgan's got presented here. Great. And that's a great segue. We, um, we will start actually with our boards, at least with, um, with objectives. So, you know, I put front and center at every meeting the three board goals that they adopted. And then um, if we've added something to that um, for this district that's up, we um, had two competing high schools that were merged um, in the, the mergers that took place a few years ago. They were in very different places in terms of, of what they were able to offer. And so we've been making that a focus of the budget discussions as we have been moving forward. So, you know, I will start my boards um, with this kind of general overview of the objectives. Um, I'd like to tip them early on to some of the budget um, concerns that we have coming down the pike. Um, this again is from six, seven, eight months ago. So we were concerned with PCBs as we still are. Um, the universal meals bill was out there um, with no indication of how that was gonna be funded. Um, we've got the COVID funding cliff. So all of the ESSER money that um, that we've been spending diligently is starting to expire um, and trying to keep my board focused on that. Um, and then some of the um, more district specific uh, concerns that I would see in this case, we were rebidding our, our transportation contract and had uh, kind of been tipped that that was going to be a significant increase. Um, I show them enrollment. We don't need to spend any time there. Um, and then I take it down another level to them. So in this case, um, we had settled a, a CBA with our teachers, but in the prior budget year, we hadn't. So there was going to be a big jump for that as we caught up with, um, with what we had budgeted. We were in negotiations with our support staff, so we didn't actually know where that was going to end. And then we started seeing from our insurance providers some of these um, kind of big but not unusual increases to some of those benefits. Um, and then in this case, the, we were building a, a sugar house for our tech center, and that was also going to be a big ticket item. So it's trying to keep those things um, front and center in, in their mind as we work through the budget. And then from there, I really tried to drive home um, the changes in staffing. And as you'll see later, um, for most of us, staffing costs are probably between 75 and 90% of our budgets. Um, if you kind of cut things out like tuition payments for, um, for district or high school kids. And so, you know, once we've gone through the process and we've um, we've determined a staffing plan for the following year, putting aside any big construction projects, the, the budget is almost done. We're only nibbling around at the edges at that point. And so this is for that um, that one district, and you can see um, this blue three quarters of the pie are the people that we pay directly. Um, this red slice here is primarily the assessment from the supervisor union, which most of that is special ed, which is mostly people, um, food service, which is about half people. Um, and so you can see that um, 
that really, if you start getting into concern about the 5%, which are the things that we buy, and you take out maybe half of that is the, the cost for utilities. Um, if you're focusing on the pencils and the copier contracts, you've really kind of missed the boat in terms of having an impact on the budget. And then I do something similar for them, um, but rather than splitting it in terms of what we buy, it's really what we do. So half of our budget is spent on the classroom. And then we've got some school administration costs and student supports here. Again, the special central services, special ed, it's going to be transportation. Um, it's going to be food service. And then we've split out um, our physical plant. So what we're spending on our buildings and grounds. I'm going to do a pause there because we're going to quickly get into denser stuff. And um, Neil, Nancy, or Heather, I don't know if you want to add anything or Susan, if there are any questions on that. Uh, you know, I think the only thing that I would add, you know, in these two pie charts, are, I think um, a great visual for board members to know um, what you guys do uh, at the bargaining table in negotiations has a very real and direct impact on your budgeting. Um, so keep that in mind um, as you engage in that work. Yeah, that's this half of their pie. <laughs> And I just also want to say to everybody who's in the meeting, if you are, if your eyes are starting to glass over because numbers scare you or you just don't <laughs> like them, this is a, you know, the budget is obviously a major piece of school board work and you will need to develop an understanding of this at some level, whatever level works for you. But I don't expect that everybody is going to digest everything that you're having put at you tonight. The budgeting process is complicated. It's obviously we're talking about a lot of money. So it can also be um, fairly controversial. And it may take you a while to get comfortable with it. And that's okay. Just don't think it's okay to ignore it because that's when you get yourself into trouble. We do have a question about um, tuition, negotiating tuition with um, public school districts to private or parochial schools. Do you want me to give that to you now or would you rather I hold it? I would say you could give Neil three hours on that and um, <laughs> he only scratch the surface. Um, he's got a great video that's out there that we've been bringing to our boards um, in the last couple of months. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'm happy to tee you up on that, Neil. Great. I can read the question. And, Neil, if you could send me the link to that, I'd be glad to put it in the resources with the follow-up email. Um, yep, yeah. So go ahead and uh, let us know what the question is, Carrie. Okay. Can sending schools negotiate tuition with receiving public districts, private or parochial schools? What are the board um, options if receiving school posted tuitions is considered too high, but local parents still want to send their students to a particular school? How do we, how do recent court cases impact out of district school, schools listed on an approved list? Uh, yeah, that one's going to take a little bit more than just 30 seconds to answer. So why don't, I'm going to take the question offline, Carrie, and we'll see if, um, if we can find, uh, if, if that person's willing to share who asked it, then we can make sure to get back to them on that. Yes, I have the name. I'll send you their, their name and their email address. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so the next thing that I will do with my board is to walk them through how those tax rates um, are calculated. This first line, the budget expenses, is really the one that the boards control. Um, they are setting the, the, um, the budget through here, the programs, here are the staff that we wanna have in our schools next year, and that's going to drive this number that we're gonna bring forward to the voters. We subtract any local revenue that we know that we're gonna get. In this case, um, 
eighty percent of this is uh, is tuition coming in from other districts because um, this district is probably pretty close to half tuition kids in its high school. So pretty significant number there for them. And this gets to what's called the ed spending amount. This is basically the amount of money that, um, that my district needs to get from the ed fund. Has an equalized pupil number that we get from the state. And this is a weighted average of the number of kids that um, we need to educate. We can, that's a pretty deep rabbit hole as well. Um, basically what we're doing is we're looking at a two year average kids to kind of equal out some of the year to year variation and each district gets to count certain kids more, kids who historically are, are more expensive to educate. This number um, changes from year to year. It's gonna change pretty significantly this year and this is the one as a business manager, I'm always the most worried about because I have no control over it. Um, and it has um, it has a pretty significant impact. So a small swing in Equalized Peoples has a pretty big swing um, downstream in the tax rate. Um, ed spending divided by Equalized Peoples gives you an ed spending per pupil number. This is a number that we tend to use to compare one district to another. Um, and in theory is um, an idea of uh, either how efficient you are with your taxpayer money or how good your offerings are for your students, depending on your, um, your slant. The dollar yield we mentioned is a, a number that's initially proposed by the tax commissioner. Um, this is one of the last things that the legislature sets on their way out of town. And so that's, um, Kind of the, the main reason why when um, your taxpayers are coming to you in March and saying, okay, you're asking me to support this budget. What is my tax rate going to be based on this? We can no longer tell them because we won't know what that yield amount is until we hit the end of the year, the end of the legislative session. And then that will give you um, an equalized residential school tax rate. So this is the tax rate that's applied to all of the towns within that district. Um, I, I'm gonna go Neil and Heather, um, anything I missed on that or anything you wanna um, flesh out on that before we go to CLA? Uh, nothing, no, nothing that you missed. No, nothing to add. Okay, so this is a district that has um, that has two separate towns. The district tax rate is that dollar seventeen, or we proposed it as a dollar seventeen. Um, we then looked at what the common level of appraisal is for each of those towns, and we have to apply that to the district tax rate, and um, that will get you the local tax rate. Um, the CLA is a, a tool that the state uses to try to make all the grand lists in the state be relatively equitable from town to town. Um, so you'll see in this one, um, with my two towns, they're both starting out at $1.17 for that district tax rate. But when we look at the CLA, um, one of them has jumped up to a buck, buck 40, basically, and one has gone up a little bit to $1.20. And that's really because of the the difference in the um, in the real estate market in those two towns over the last few years and um, how recently they have had a reappraisal. And so I think uh, this is one of the harder things um, to explain to folks when they've got properties that maybe even border each other. It is the same school district. And you see here, there's a, a 20 cent difference in terms of what their tax rate is. Um, this is another one where we could spend two hours on it. Um, the, the short story is um, really that that CLA is meant to, to make the different grand lists from town to town fair across the state. And I think, um, uh, I think conceptually it works. Um, it gives you some um, strange things in, in practice um, like what we had in this district this year. So I don't know if there are any 
questions on that on tax rates or any additions from other panelists? Um, the only other thing I would add is that there is a um, identified point that when your CLA reaches a certain percentage, it will trigger a reappraisal in your town. And is that 80%? Am I right with that? Uh, 85, I believe. Okay. Um, so... I believe that there were quite a few towns this past year that triggered that reappraisal um, point. And um, so we'll be seeing a lot of towns uh, assuming that they can actually get those reappraisals done because there's only so many appraisers that can go in there and um, do that work. We'll see changes happening. And you'll see in Morgan's example where Richford is at 104%, my guess is that was probably about a time when you had a reappraisal. Um, it had been reappraised fairly recently and the market has been pretty, um, had been pretty still there. Um, and, and I think you're absolutely right. I know of my six towns, five are in the place where they're gonna need to reappraise. And one of the things that you'll see is that you know, Enosburg has a, has a low CLA, so that's really pushing the tax rate up pretty significantly. When they reappraise, in theory, this pops up to 100%. Um, the last time my the town that I lived in reappraised, we actually went up to 110% uh, when the state looked at what the, the listers had done. And so when that happens, your tax rate's going to plummet and as school board members, you're gonna sort of look like heroes for a little time until people actually get their tax bill and they say, yeah, my, my tax rate went down 30 cents, but my appraisal is twice what it was last year. And so the, the CLA um, and those reappraisals um, are gonna move those tax rates, but not necessarily the tax liability that people are feeling. Yeah, and we've been trying to talk a little bit more about the actual tax bill rather than the rate because that does that can be a bit deceiving in, um, like you said, reappraisal rate drops. People think, wow, that's fantastic, but really in the end they're paying the same amount or even potentially more even though their rate went down. So we've been trying to talk more about the final you know, tax liability rather than the rate. All right. And then this is a chart that I uh, used just to kind of show them in comparison. Um, this was when the districts were unified um, or um, presented their first unified budget. And you'll see the district-wide rates um, had been level and it really dropped. And that was primarily because of the strong yield, um, which meant um, a, you know, a dollar on the tax rate was able to raise more money um, and we, I think the other components of the Ed Fund were, were stronger than had been expected. But you'll see, even though the district tax rate has been dropping pretty precipitously, the tax rates that are on people's bills for both towns have been relatively flat. And that is because of the CLA falling because the real estate market has been so hot. Um, so we, we do go out and we do try to explain that to people. And I think, um, some of them get it for the amount of time that they're in the meeting, but you know it's so arcane that once you walk out of that meeting, it gets um, pretty fuzzy again pretty quickly. Um, and then the last thing that I do in my budget um, prep meetings or budget development meetings with my board is to keep walking them through the warning uh, as it's likely to appear on town meeting day for us or at the annual meeting for other districts. So the first section, these are all the offices that are, are going to be elected. Um, we then have the, the budget article, um, an article that gives us authority to borrow money um, come July 1st if we need to. And then if we have anything special that we're going to the voters for, um, in this case, we had about $145,000 left over in our general fund. 
and we were asking the voters to allow us to put half of that into a capital reserve fund. We need to get permission from that. And then there was a small plot of land adjacent to one of our schools that we wanted to buy and we needed to get permission for that from them. Um, and that's really, that's the process that I go through with them. It's very repetitive. Um, I don't start in August as they do in Neal's district, but we will um, certainly start in September talking with principals about staffing and then um, September, October, start um, bringing those plans to the board. Um, and then again, I think most of us are looking to warn that budget in the mid to late January timeline. So Susan, I'll hold there if there are any questions on the, the timeline or the process before we get into um, you know, what you do once you do have a, a past budget. Anybody have anything you want clarity on? Or more? We don't have any typed questions. Okay, and I don't see any hands raised. So you've either got everybody completely with you <laughs> or... <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't contemplate the or. <laughs> That's rare. We're usually in the or in this, uh, this field. <laughs> um, so a couple of slides on fiscal monitoring. This is um, a copy of a report that I uh, send out to my boards every month. And I think most places will show some version of this on some sort of frequency. Um, it may only be quarterly. There's one, um, one system in the state where I think they are, we're only um, doing it once a year. Um, we do ours uh, monthly. If you've got a budget committee that meets more frequently than that, you may have them getting close to real-time information. Um, but on all of them, you'll probably find that there's a, a section on how we split out the expenses you're looking at. So I talked about, you know, we can, identify expenses by location and which kids and what we're doing with it and what we're buying. And so you know, this line here would be um, what we're spending on teachers and paraeducators in our pre-K program in one of our schools. You will have um, some version of what the, the spending plan is. I show them the adopted budget and um, a current budget. If we, um, if we get into trouble, usually because we have more high school kids coming or fewer high school kids coming, depending on which district you're in, um, and we have to adjust for that. I may be going to principals and saying, okay, we're gonna need to cut half a million dollars out of your budget. I'm taking some money away from salaries because I know you hired cheap this year. And so <laughs> occasionally the, the current budget in my system will be different than the adopted budget. Um, you'll get some version of the money that you spent either to the month or in this case, I just give them how much we spent for the year um, as of the, the report. And then some indication of how much our software system knows that we're going to spend. So that's called um, encumbrances. And we have a pretty good idea when we have a teacher on contract, how much we're going to be paying them in May and June and over the summer. Um, less so on, on things like supplies. And so we, t we tend not to encumber any money for that. And then lastly, the variance. And so whether um, you're in a good place or a bad place um, in terms of, of your plan spending compared to your budget. And um, again, different systems will have different philosophies on how they do that. Um, my predecessor would have been very worried about a $500 deficit um, on one line in a budget. I am really looking more at the school level and I'm in touch with my principals and say, okay, are you gonna be under the 3 million that you have to spend this year? Um, you'll also likely get a report that looks something like this um, in December or January. Uh, in my system, we only bring it to the supervisory union board. Um, and basically, this is a, a checklist that's contemplated in statute. And we need to go through and tell our board, um, going through all these steps, who does what, um, 
It's about two pages long. This is one section of it. And this is really there so that we are on notice of, of telling you, you know, who's reconciling your bank accounts. Um, is anybody spending above what we know we're paying them in salary? Things like that. Um, it's really, in my mind, it's secondary to an audit, um, but it is in statute. And so um, we're on notice of saying, here's what we think is going on. And then you as a board are on notice so that if you read this, accept this, and <coughs> I have had said somewhere, oh yeah, my treasurer is driving a new Lexus every day of the week. Um, you know, you've been put on notice as a board that there might be something going on. And then finally, um, an annual audit is required by statute. Um, it's in my district, each of them is about a hundred page document. Um, there are very few firms now that are auditing in Vermont. And so most of them are gonna be similar from district to district. Um, I send out a letter to my board when I get the final audit and just kind of point to five places that I think they should always be looking to try to trim that 100 pages down to 10 or 20 that they can really focus on. And then as a board, if there are ever any concerns, um, you should always feel um, at liberty to have your auditors come into a board meeting um, and meet with you directly. And, and I give them the option to, for us to, to bring them in and, and have them meet in executive session with the auditors without any administration in the room. Um, just so they can um, find out if there are any any concerns. Um, but generally, if there are, they're going to show up in this um, opinion section or the report on internal control, um, and they will um, they will give you a tip if they um, are feeling not confident in what your business office or your superintendent's office is doing. Um, and that's very big picture in terms of the monitoring piece. Um, Again, I'll, I'll turn it over to the others, um, Nancy, Neil, um, Heather, if you, if there's anything additional that you do in your districts. Uh, nope, nothing additional for us. Not for us either. Ours is very similar as well. We do a quarterly um, report out. And, and just to sort of put that big picture look on this again, the board's responsibilities here are to adopt a budget, which you then present to your community who votes on it. And then the board is charged with monitoring the fiscal health of the district as the year progresses. And, and so that's Morgan showing you some of the reports that he uses with his boards. Um, so that they have the information that they need. Invariably, you're going to have a CPA on your board <laughs> who <laughs> is going to get into the nitty gritty of one line item with one particular um, transaction that they question. And if you want to roll your eyes when they do that, that's okay with me because the board really is not in the position of micromanaging the budget, or for that matter, anything else, uh, but rather to have a sense that everything's on track or it isn't. And if it isn't, why isn't it? And, you know, is it a question of the new Lexuses in the school parking lot? Or is it a question of you had a lot of high need special ed kids this year and there's no way to budget for that? There's no way to plan for that. Um, so the board has the the job of accountability to the community, which means it's really important to understand the stories behind the numbers. And I'll leave it at that. Well, and the board then also has the, the audit, I'm sorry, to, <laughs> to be good consumers of the audit and understand if there are issues that need to be sussed out. Susan, this is Nancy for the past couple of years, we, uh, one of our board members is a CPA, owns his own business, but he has been, except, has done exceptionally well in breaking down that budget and 
to put it in layman's terms so that our community is understanding what we're presenting to them when we present the budget to them. And it has gone so well every single time because, because they were better able to understand the budget that we were presenting to them. So sometimes yeah. having those CPAs on the board is uh, to your advantage also, and it has certainly been with ours. That's wonderful. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. And, and absolutely, um, you know, every individual has their strengths and their weaknesses. And if, the, if you've got somebody who can take their knowledge and translate it into plain English, you're way ahead of the game. Okay, anything else on the budget? What the whole issue of budgeting, I, it's so complex and there are so many more nuances than we were able to go into tonight. But in, in theoretical sense, anybody want to clear anything up or have any questions or something has already come up at your board meetings that you didn't quite put into perspective because you didn't have the background? Or are we ready to move on? Okay, I'm gonna go with we're ready to move on. So I would like to thank Morgan and um, Heather very much for being here with us tonight. I think we're gonna be moving away from the budget discussion. So you're welcome to stick around, but please don't feel as though you need to. I, I know you've had long days already. Uh, thank you Susan? very much. Yes. Susan, I just had another question pop up. Great. Um, it's how has the new special education funding process impacted the budget planning and district business with district business managers? Do you want me to sure. take that one, Morgan? Sure. I was just going to say significantly and then go off mic. Yeah, I think, um, you know, same answer here. It has been significant. We went from a model that was based on reimbursement. And so, um, you know, it wasn't 100% reimbursement, but we knew if we, um, someone used the example of having um, a high cost kiddo in your district. And we knew that if those um, were unplanned, that we were going to get some bit of reimbursement for those. And the new model is a um, census block grant funding model. So, um, you know, if your costs are, are going up, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get reimbursed for those, but you are, um, you know, required to provide that um, education for those um, students. So it certainly has become a challenge. And I would say one of the other challenges, um, and I'm in districts that benefited from that change, um, is that it hit us at the same time. One, we've been struggling to hire anyone. Um, and then two, we are struggling to find those alternative placements for our kids that need them. And so it, it feels like we haven't yet had a normal year under that new funding um, funding scheme to really see um, how it's gonna work. And I, I'll just tag on to that, as Neil and Morgan have alluded to, we are also in the midst of changing the funding formula, the way the logistics are calculated um, with respect to, Neil talked about the weighted students, the weighting, um, and that has been a study that's been undertaken at the state level for mm -hmm. since 2019, I believe, and has finally um, made a change to the, the weighting of the different categories of students that cost different amounts of money to educate. Um, and we're, we're phasing into that as I understand it. Um, so we're not completely into the new yet, but 
we're moving there. And in the meantime, the Act 173, the special ed piece is having implications for some districts are seeing benefits in their budget. They're seeing advantages and some districts are actually finding that they are having to raise more money um, based on the the new formulation of special and funding and I think that's a good place to stop with that for tonight just so we don't go into the weeds and and really overwhelm anybody who's who's just first hearing about all of this Anything else? Carrie? No, it looks like that's our last question. Okay. So again, I want to thank our Heather and Morgan for sharing their insights with us tonight and helping to get us all a little more familiar with that process of budgeting for our school districts. Thank you so much. I, Stick around if you want to, but don't feel like you need to. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Susan, I did want to say that. So I did see uh, one question in the chat that had to do with um, any effective ways of including communities in the budgeting process. Ah, yes. And and I was um, I can echo that sentiment. We've had challenges with that locally. Um, there have been a couple of years, most recently, I remember, where um, at literally the very last budget meeting, um, before the board approved the budget that was going to go on the warrant article, a group of folks came forward advocating that we needed to add Spanish language instruction at the elementary school. Um, a year before that, I believe we had a group of parents show up almost at the very last meeting again, advocating that we needed to redo the baseball field. Um, in both of those cases, they can be a little bit frustrating for board members, especially because a lot of us have been going through the process you know, since the summer. And then suddenly somebody shows up in January um, asking for some major change. Um, I can't say that we've been hugely successful locally, but what we have tried to do over recent years is make sure that the public knows that the time to voice those concerns is at the beginning of the budget process, you know, late summer, early fall. Um, if you show up at a meeting in January asking for a big change, it's too late at that point. And so uh, it comes through making an announcement at board meetings over the summer, you know, heading into the fall. Um, for those communities that have active list serves, uh, we found that it's helpful to post those types of messages on the list serve to get the word out um, and then sometimes send it home. Um, if your schools have like weekly newsletters from the principal and stuff like that to include it in there, just as a way to get the information out so that the community knows, uh, you know, when the board is meeting to discuss the budget and at the right time to bring those types of concerns forward. I know that when I served on boards, uh, I served on two different boards in my community, the elementary school board and later the high school board. I followed my kids to high school. Um, but and at that time, my district was not unified, which it subsequently has become. Um, and one thing that we always did was we held at least two budget forums during the budgeting process for the community, um, specifically trying to suss out those kinds of thoughts that might otherwise surface at the 11th hour. And when I was on a high school board, we did something that I thought was pretty effective in theory anyway. we Every board member was encouraged to find one or two budget buddies from their communities who became part of the regular board discussion, not the board discussions, but they sat at the table with the board during budget work sessions. Um, and they voiced opinions, you know, it was just, it was more people at the table, thus more opinions at the table. And, and they obviously were people who cared, but who didn't necessarily follow along as closely as we board members. And so they had a different voice. And often the questions that came from them and the comments that came from them were really, really useful 
if not in the actual budget process, then certainly in how we talked about the, the adopted budget to the town. Um, so those are just two thoughts. Um, the whole topic of engaging your community is a huge one. A budget season is maybe the easiest time in some ways, um, but the more you can keep your community engaged in, in what's going on in your school district, the easier it will be to have them chime in at budget time too. And there are a few more notes in here. Let's see what we've got. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for, uh, so in Essex Westford, they too had um, community forums to discuss the budget while it was in development. Um, in their case, they did one in each of the two towns that are in their district and a third one online. Thank you for that. Um, and somebody else is saying to uh, since Act 46 and the merger of the district reduced community engagement in the budget process, um, which is a unfortunate fallout, but I think people don't feel as attached to their budgets when they know that it takes care of the schools in, in their town and the next town and the town after that and the one behind them. Um, it, it, so that's another area where boards really have an opportunity to engage community as defined by your school district, which may not be your town. Um, and, and that's a challenge unto itself because you're defining a, a, an entity that otherwise has no continuity. Um, you know, a, a unified school district that cross towns, there may not be anything else that crosses towns the same way as the school district. Um, and so to create and build and strengthen that community will have its challenges, but it, but it's certainly going to make the district stronger. Have we addressed all the comments here? I think so. Good. Uh, we, you, we used to do this training in March, and we moved it to May to give you a chance to have a few meetings under your belt first, because otherwise, you don't know what you don't know, and people were coming and really like a deer in the headlights, not having anything to to relate to as we go through all of this. But let's just, I, so what I wanna talk about now, and this is really intended to be discussion. Um, so I hope that you will all chime in um, with questions and insights that you've gained from the meetings that you have attended. We're going to talk about what what to expect of board meetings, um, and I'm going to try and share my screen. There we go. Okay. Um, so these are components of every board meeting. They this needs to exist by state statute or the state board of education rules. Um, districts do these things different ways, which is valid. Um, and maybe you learn from somebody else's comments that they do it better than you do. And maybe you have something to bring home. But what to expect at board meetings? There should be a fixed schedule of your board meeting. So you're on the second Tuesday or the third Wednesday or whatever your meeting date is, but it's got to be consistent. There may be special meetings thrown in there, but the town, the community needs to know when the board meets, where the board meets, and what the board is going to talk about. And that's the agenda. So the agendas have to be posted publicly um, and are also circulated to board members through the use of a packet. So board packets usually get to board members and some boards are still doing these in paper and others are doing them digitally. I actually have served on a committee where I, they sent me the packet digitally ahead of time and then showed up with printouts, which I completely <laughs> didn't understand. I wanted to save a tree, um, but you'll, you'll get the packet of 
all of the documentation that's relevant to the agenda items on the agenda so that you have the information that you need to understand what the issue is, what the background is. If, if this is a discussion item, you'll have enough to be able to discuss. If this is an item that you're voting on, an action item, you've already had the discussion, you've already had the background, it may be provided again in the packet. Um, but what seems to be really inconsistent is how much in advance of a meeting do you get a packet? Neil, do you want to chime in? Or Nancy, do you want to comment on that? What's it like in your experience? This is Nancy. Our board meetings are on Wednesday nights, and our superintendent gets it to us the weekend prior to that. So it may be Saturday, or it may, and you may add something informational type stuff on Sunday, but we have it uh, enough days that we've all got a chance to sit down and really look at it and and uh, make sure we know what's going to happen during the meeting. Neil? Say, yeah, we're pretty similar. You, typically three to five days before the board meeting, you mm -hmm. have the, the packet available. So I would just like to comment that from my perspective, um, that's really evidence of a couple of very well run school districts <laughs> because I have heard stories about boards getting the packet the day of the meeting um, or at the meeting. Well, there's material in that packet you need to have prepared or at least reviewed ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have enough time to do that, that's a problem. And if you're really finding that that's consistent, that's the kind of thing that a, a board can create a, a procedure about and it, and also include as an item in the superintendent's about eval annual evaluation. You know, we need the packets three days in advance of the meetings or whatever um, the board may choose to stipulate. Um, but do be on the lookout for those packets. It is every board member's responsibility to go through the packet, to understand what's in there, and to be prepared when you get to the meeting. If you have to start flipping through the pages, whether it's digital or paper, to find the right piece of paper to start reading it when the agenda item is, is mm -hmm. on the table, you're wasting everybody's time, including your own. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, make, make a commitment to that and make sure that you have that packet with enough time to do something with it. Okay, so uh, questions in the chat are good ones. Um, one says the board doesn't send out a packet. Do folks get a PDF that includes everything or a link to a Google folder? And somebody else chimed in, we get a link to a Google folder. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be another way to have, make sure that everybody has access. Um, as long as you're getting the link with adequate time to prepare everything. That's very clever, by the way, um, I think. Uh, so by state statute, believe it or not, <laughs> school board meetings are run using Robert's Rules of Order. Anybody surprised to hear that? Can you address the scope of what an um, agenda item can be and still be legal under the warning? An example came up in my board meeting last week in which a pre presentation was warned, but a vote to take action based on that presentation was not. We voted, but I think there would have been more response from the community and the board with a more uh, specific agenda item. Um, and, and the, you know, there is a webinar in the archive on Robert's rules. So I'll just throw that out there for those of you who need to nerd out a little bit. 
Um, Susan, this is Nancy on Robert's rules, because I know this because we have a very small board of only five of us, that some of those rules are adjusted if you just have that small of a board. Right. Uh, one of the things that comes to my mind immediately is that motions need not be seconded. Right. Uh, there so is, there are some for these for us smaller boards. There is a Robert's rules for smaller boards. Right. And that is one of the big things that differentiates it. And the other big thing that differentiates the small boards is that the board chair gets to vote. Mm -hmm. Always, not mm -hmm. only as a tiebreaker. Right. And I will say that our Robert's Rules webinar was one of our highest attended ever webinars. So it's it's wow. it's an important thing that it's a uh, highly recommended that you watch. Yeah. Because it's not the most scintillating topic, but it's if you're not comfortable with it, then the flow of the meeting won't won't make as much sense if you just right. have a basic understanding of, of why we structure things the way we structure them. Now, that said, there is no dictated legislated sequence in which agendas are listed. So I know at VSBA, we really encourage boards to put the, the discussion items up first. And mm -hmm. the reason is very basic and very simple. That's when board members have most energy. And so <laughs> if you're going to be talking about a topic that requires some understanding and some has some complexity, that's the best time to do it. Not when you're have been sitting for an hour and a half and everybody's, you know, jonesing to get out of there. Um, but the responsibility of developing the agenda rests with the board chair who works in conjunction with the superintendent. That doesn't mean that you can't have input. Most board chairs ask for input or will circulate a draft ag agenda um, prior so that you have a chance to comment on it before it becomes the the fixed presented to the public agenda for the meeting. Another bit of Vermont law that really does influence board meetings is Vermont's open meeting law. And there again, we have at least one, maybe two webinars in the archive on Vermont's open meeting law. I don't want to get into any of the particulars of it right now because we could have a three hour conversation <laughs> about open meeting law, but we as a public body. School boards exist because they're created in the state's laws in Vermont, and so we are subject to the same regulations as any other public body. That means open meeting law and the byproducts of open meeting law, executive session and public comment are all designed to ensure transparency of public dollars and public uh, resources and also accountability. So the school board is completely accountable to your community and you have an obligation to keep them knowing what they need to know um, and making it available to them. So executive session is the opportunity to go behind closed doors. There are very, very specific reasons that a board may choose to go or may vote to go into executive session. Um, no Decisions are ever made in an executive session it is for discussion of very specific topics. And you'll notice on every agenda that there's a section for public comment. And that too is required by Vermont laws to ensure that the public has an opportunity to influence decisions that are being made with a about and utilizing public resources. So public can come in, they can talk about whatever they wanna talk about that's not on the agenda. 
Um, and this is another piece that boards handle really differently. Some boards put the public comment at the beginning of the meeting. And, and that way they, they see it as a service to the community because then they don't have to sit through the whole meeting just to get their two cents in. Um, other boards break it up and have public comment for each agenda item. Neil, I think you do something like that, don't you? Uh, we've got a hybrid approach. So uh -huh. we have public comment at the beginning of the meeting. If anybody wants to comment on an item that is not otherwise on the agenda. And then as we go through the remaining agenda items, if somebody would like to speak to that agenda item, we allow that as well. Okay. Nancy, your board has another take on the public comment that's amazing to me. And I, I think you're unique in this. Would you share about that? Are you talking about the second meeting? Yep. Yeah. We, uh, Last year, we decided that we would like to engage more in our community as a school board. And so what we decided to do, we meet our board meets twice a month. And um, our first meeting is always, we considered our, what we call it our business meeting. And the second meeting is our involvement with the community. And that's a chance for uh, the community to come and talk with us, for us to talk with them. Sometimes it's a special um, emphasis meeting that we just really want to get out uh, information to the community and a chance for them to come in and and talk with us or share their their experiences with us. Uh, maybe just to bring something to our attention that we didn't realize what was going on. Um, I think it's been very very well received and uh, and we're going to continue to do it. I was we gonna also, ask. also during our during our uh, first meeting, during our business meeting, we also have a chance uh, for public comment too, and it's at the start of the meeting. How well attended is your second meeting, your community meeting? I think Coach told me uh, told me there was like 134 online. Many of them don't physically come in, mm -hmm. uh, but but we still do hybrid meetings. And so that gives them a chance to stay at home if they want to, or if the weather's bad, they can still participate in it without uh, having to get out in the weather. Um, oh. So sometimes it's not that many, maybe 40 or 60. But uh, Kevin was telling me the other day there was 134 on our last one. And just for reference, most boards will tell you they never have anybody come from their communities unless they're discussing that some hot topic, mm -hmm. controversial subject, in which case they they know in advance that they're going to have a lot of people. Right. Um, so that's really spectacular and quite unusual to have that kind of attendance from the community at the board meetings. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so. The next two items on this list, meeting management and role of the chair, are quite intertwined. The, yep. the job of the chair is to keep the meeting running smoothly, to assure that every all board members have an opportunity to speak to every agenda item that they want to, that the public is treated respectfully and recognizes what the board's reach is and where that stops. Um, they The chair is, is likely to meet with the superintendent or in the case of um, individual school, you know, one board, one school kind of situation um, with the, maybe the principal but with administration to plan the agenda, to understand the issues. And then the board chair has a responsibility to make sure the rest of the board is informed, not about the particulars of the conversation. I had, a, you know, I talked to Joe yesterday, but if there are, if there's any substance that the board needs to know, this comes up a lot around, you know, the superintendent gets a call a, about some sort of behavior issue in the school and it's extreme and it's a parent calling because 
you know, there, my son told me that so-and-so did this <laughs> and, you know, um, and in the moment, it seems like it is the biggest thing in the world and the thing it's going to blow up. I'll give you an example. When I was serving on a K-8 board, there was a seven, I think she was a seventh grade student was pregnant. Well, you can imagine in any small town in Vermont, that just spread like wildfire. But most, I had kids in the school, so I had heard about it. But most of the, my fellow board members did not. And so we had a special session at our board meeting where administration pulled us together in executive session to tell us that this situation was going on. And here's, here's what we knew. Here's what we didn't know. Um, here's how the school was handling it. And that was so helpful because it was a buzz in the community. And if we hadn't been apprised of that officially by the administration who was dealing with it, people were going to come to us as board members and ask what the heck was going on. And do you know what's, you know, blah, 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 blah. and who's the father and, you know, all that junk that you get in the small towns. And we, we were able to go out, have a public face that was very consistent and knowledgeable. So important to have that kind of understanding. But it could have been a conversation just as easily that administration had with the chair of the board, and then the chair would have informed the rest of us. Either of those works well, um, as long as it happens one way or the other. Public decorum is on this list because in the last 18 months, two years, that's become a sad, sad reality at a lot of board meetings um, and, and elsewhere, <laughs> um, right? We're all, many people are bemoaning the end of public decorum in our culture. And there... It, it's incumbent on the whole board, but especially board leadership to maintain control of the meeting. If the, you know, if something in the public sector of the meeting is disruptive, nobody gets their work. Your board meeting, while it is subject to open meeting law and it is open to the public, is not a meeting of the public. This is your business meeting, as Nancy pointed out. So you need to make sure, you as a board, need to make sure that you're going to get to the end of that agenda and cover all those topics. And disruptions are just going to derail you. And, I, you know, I, I hear stories about board meetings that go on for four and a half hours, and that just should never have to happen. It just should never have to be. So if, if you're in a situation like that, where your meetings get out of control, work with your chair, see how the rest of you can help to shore that up and, and bring the meetings back to your table, to the board table. Minutes are the flip side of agendas. Um, Robert's Rules requires minutes be taken of every meeting to record what happened, what transpired at the meeting. It does not need, you know, meet, minute, Hmm. Minutes don't need to encapsulate every conversation that the board has, but certainly every vote, what the the yays and nays, what the vote count was. If it is a situation where members are polled, then that needs to be reflected in the in the minutes as well. Um, and then the minutes get read. It's get last month's minutes are in this month's packet. So you read them, you make sure that that is a reflection of your memory of what happened. And often, in my case, it also is jogging my memory as to what happened. Um, but if anything doesn't read right, you have an opportunity before those minutes get approved and finalized to suggest other wording or add more context if it's necessary. So that kind of rounds out the fundamentals of what happens at a board meeting. 
And I, as I said at the beginning, I know we're at 6.30 and I don't want to keep anybody, but I'm happy to stick around and talk about if, if things have happened at your meetings that you're confused by or wondering if that's sort of standard protocol, please feel free to stick on the line. Or I, normally I would say you can call me, you can email me, you can text me, you can send me <laughs> smoke signals, except I'm not the person. Um, you met Debbie very briefly at the beginning of the meeting, and she is the person, and you will have her contact information, and she will be available at, you know, her job is to be there for you. So you have a resource right there. Um, I, I did have a couple of questions that I wanted to put out there for reflection. I don't think we really have time to talk about them today, but um, I, I wish I could remember who it was said at the beginning of the meeting that you've been thinking a lot about representative of versus representative for from last time. And so here are just some prompts of things to think about as, as you go forward. And I particularly draw your attention to that third question. Expect that your preconceived notions of what school board work is will change. Do <laughs> you think that's fair, Nancy? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, and absolutely. I also want to remind everybody about the monthly webinars um, mm -hmm. and the meetings that we have coming up there. Well, we have a bit of a hiatus in the summer. Hopefully your boards will be having retreats. Um, but September and October are regional meetings for VSBA. And those are you can are already set up. You can register for them on the VSBA website already. Um, and similarly, the annual conference will take place in late October at Lake Mori. Um, what are they? The resort at Lake Mori, I think, is what they call it. And Fairly, which is um, for those of you who don't know it, it's it's a unique Vermont place. It, it and it's beautiful. So. The annual conference is a day and a half of rich programming on hot topics in education, as well as some more um, what I call evergreen topics, things that board members just always need to have in, in their thoughts. And then there are resources for you already on our website. We talked about these a little bit. I know I've been talking the past webinars, I, I just find that, that it's a really concise way to get the information you need. I hope that you have already taken the time to visit the new board member toolkit on the website and, and peruse the book that we sent you. If for any reason you have not received that book, please let Carrie know. Carrie will get one out to you. Um, and we also have an online toolkit that's broader than just for new members. As I promised, whoa, <laughs> why is this happening? Hold on, hold on. I'm just going to say, Susan, while you're looking that up, I sent out probably 25 of those essentials books on Friday. So if you had asked for it at the last meeting, at the last uh, webinar, then it's in the mail. Excellent. Thanks, <laughs> Carrie. Um, and this is Debbie, whom you met earlier here's her contact information. You'll be getting a set of the slides. So you'll have that. Um, it is my understanding that the VSBA staff is all working hybrid now, partly in the office in Montpelier, partly not. Um, so the we're, we're all using our cell phones as well as the office phone number. So please do reach out to Debbie. Um, she may be a little overwhelmed right in the beginning, but um, I'm sure that she's going to be up to speed in no time. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I hope that you have found these snippets of board work um, conversations useful, insightful. Thank you to Nancy and to Neil for <laughs> your insights. Anything else you want, any closing thoughts you want to throw out there, either of you? Oh, no. Just have a good evening. Yes. So I thank you all for your for coming. 
Thank I'm you. here. I'll be the last one to leave. How's that? <laughs> Good, Good night, night everyone. everyone.